So welcome to a brand new series of interviews that I'm going to be running on the channel called What Makes You Tick? And I'm going to be speaking to a range of really interesting people from the world of watches. And I'm delighted today to be speaking to Richard Bank from Studio Underdog. Hi, Richard. Hey, thanks for having me. So for viewers of the channel who, let's say, aren't really familiar with you and the Studio Underdog story, um, just talk us through it. So, you know, where did it all start? And, you know, tell us what that journey has been like. <laughs> so, God, so it's only really 18 months ago. So I started in March last year. That's when I, I launched the brand. Um, and it was very much, it was a bit of a happy accident, to be honest. It wasn't, you know, it it wasn't well thought through. I didn't have a big, a big vision as to what I wanted to achieve. Essentially, it was it was a lockdown project for myself. Um, so yeah, in March I, I launched. I did a, a pre order, a, a crowdfunding campaign, and that essentially helped to bring this idea, uh, all the ideas that I had, to life. And it's been a bit of a whirlwind from there. So yeah, as you said, if people don't know who I am, so I'm I'm the founder, um, founder, the design director, the marketing manager, the T boy, whatever. Uh, for Studio Underdog, so I'm a one-man brand, um, and ha have had just such a great response from the community in 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 the short time that, that the brand's been around. So, um, so you said that this was a lockdown project. So, where where were you before you started Studio Underdog, and what inspired you to to start the business and to start the brand? So, my background in design. So I studied product design, absolutely loved it, uh, and then was very much just trying to get in, get a, a foot in the door of London, trying to get any design related job that I could possibly get in the city. Um, and it, the first job that I managed to secure happened to be uh, for a company that designs and develops uh, watches for other brands. So I started working there, designing anything from, well, I started designing Minions watches, Pepper Pig watches, did some Star Wars, Darth Vader watches, uh, and worked my way up uh, in, in that role, uh, and then sort of took over the the role of, of designer and developer for, for Braun or Brown, a kind of a, a German brand. But that was, that was my... Um, yeah, that's how I discovered the world of, you know, the world of watches, this industry, because up until that point, I had, I wasn't aware of, of the industry. I, I'd never really worn a watch. I would borrowed my dad's watch to the uh, to the interview because I knew I couldn't uh, possibly show up to an interview for a, a watch company without <laughs> one on my wrist. Um, and yeah, that that kind of gave me visibility of this industry that I instantly found so interesting. Um so that's yeah, that's how that's how I got into it. it, it again, a, a bit of an accident. So I find that really interesting that because um, I guess a lot of people who start micro brands in in the watch world, you know, they probably come into it as enthusiasts to begin with, um, and you've come in in a very different path. But I guess you probably became an enthusiast pretty quickly. I became an enthusiast very quickly. Yeah, um, just that was my kind of means of discovering the industry. But as soon as I did discover its existence, it was. Uh, it was so obvious to me that, um, yeah, that it was something that, that I'd like to kind of get more involved in. Um, and then lockdown as well, that kind of gave me that little extra push to actually start doing something myself um, and to kind of branch out a little bit. But yeah, I had I guess I'd had this kind of ideas in in, the, in my head and on the back of my mind. But until I actually had the kind of the spare time or, or not even spare time, just time to think, do you know what, I, I, I've, got, I've got no excuse now. You know, I've got nothing better to do. I may as well start, uh, start, start kicking into, into gear. And, and that's what I did. Uh, that's, that's really fascinating. And, you know, I mean, you've gone from, I guess, working with a company who are kind of famous for their simplicity of their watches, you know, the very minimalist sort of Bauhaus designs of, of brown watches and clocks to then launching a watch that's the complete opposite of that, you know, with the watermelon. Um, so, you know, as I understand it, the watermelon was the first watch that you designed um, of the ones that we have now from Studio Underdog. But tell me what inspired that design. 
So, so yeah, as, as you rightly said, that I think part of the inspiration was the kind of the rebellion, as it were, from from when I look at the the work that I was doing with Braun, it was black and white dials. Possibly, if you were feeling, you know, if you wanted to do a bit exciting, something a bit exciting, you'd maybe go for a grey dial. You know, that was very much kind <laughs> of the the, the limits. So I think, yeah, pink and green and blue and whatever, the, this was a, a way that I, this was my form of rebellion. That being said, it's not necessarily a polar opposite because I think there's a lot of um, design details or thought processes that was sort of ingrained in me from, from working in, in, that, in that industry before. So something that you might notice is, you know, a lot of the design decisions are still very functional. I've kind of, um, you know, f uh, function always, you know, follows um, follows form as well. Mm -hmm. Any tweaks or anything quirky that I'm doing to the watches, I'm making sure that it's not actually hindering its it, its initial function. And anything that I can do to, you know, to keep function at the forefront, you know, I make sure I do. So that was part of the design challenge was was making sure that I could find this right balance um, between between it being kind of a fun, playful object as well as still, you know, still performing as, as it should. Um, yeah, so I've gone on a bit of a tangent there. What was the, what was the original uh, the original query? Oh, inspiration for the watermelon. That's um, right. I wish I could say there was I wish I could say there was a eureka moment uh, where it suddenly <laughs> came to me, but I don't know. I'm not sure what it was. I think just this idea of of something is is silly. Um, you know, as a watermelon inspiring a watch and inspiring a piece of horology, which is, you know, a super serious industry. Uh, obviously, no one had really kind of uh, necessarily taken that approach before. Um, so, yeah, no, no eureka moment, no watermelons falling from the sky. Um, but it <laughs> obviously it, it, it hit a chord. Absolutely. I just find it fascinating to think, you know, kind of out of all of the fruit that you could have chosen or maybe it didn't even need to be a fruit, but, you know, it ended up being a watermelon. <laughs> well, that's it. And, and you know, it's, you know, I take inspiration from from anywhere and everywhere. The The second one that I, that I designed was the uh, the Desert Sky. And that was based off a, off a pair of trainers uh -huh. uh, that right I had here. that... Uh, is that the one behind you? Yeah. Oh, that, oh you've I've got it there. The oh, well, I'll show you. Let me grab... Uh, I've got that... Um, there you go. This was a, a pair of shoes. Um, oh, wow. So you can see the, the kind of the colour palette I saw in these released and I was like, just the, the colour palette, it just it just works so well. It really works. So I kind of yeah. started, uh, started, you know, messing around with similar colours and seeing how it could all kind of work together in a watch design, which is obviously a, a very different, um, you know, a different base, as it were. So, yeah, inspiration from from anywhere and everywhere. Yeah, I find it really interesting what you're saying about kind of um, balancing form and function and not just doing things for the sake of aesthetics. Because, I mean, I'm not sure if you're aware, but my background is a designer as well, but a graphic designer. And, you know, things, one of the things that I picked up on very early on with the uh, Studio Underdog watches was how you'd position the text on the dial either side of the resting position of the chronograph hand, which is really an quite an obvious thing in some ways when you see it but nobody else does it you know and everybody pretty much everyone puts the text just under the 12 o'clock position and it's always intersected by that hand it's know? yeah especially for a chronograph you know i've that kind of that yeah the the background of that is very much my experience from wearing a chronograph is i very rarely have the um uh, the chrono the central chronos hand running it obviously it's if it's running constantly, it's it's not serving any any function, and it's just sort mm. of eating up the power reserve. So I'd imagine myself and and most just leave it sitting at twelve. So the kind of the idea to offset the the branding and some of the text and and put it either side, it was a bit of a kind of a natural design development where I started by designing uh, a big eye. I knew I wanted this kind of this big eye because it's kind of quite vintage, but then the use of these, you know, polar polarizing kind of colors then made it really modern. So that was the first step. And then I was trying to figure out how I can balance, you know, how I can create balance again within that dial 
when it feels so weighted because of that big eye. Mm. So I started messing around with some of the dial elements and obviously the text to, to, to kind of create that balance again. And again, it was a, it was a bit of a happy accident. I moved the text around, saw that this kind of it created it created that balance with with the big eye moving it either side. It all just sort of fell into place. Um, and that's, I guess, part of the design process. You're kind of testing things, messing around and, uh, and it all kind of, yeah, it, it fell into place. And it looks, as you said, once it's there, it looks like such a simple solution. But it took quite a while to get there and, and you know, try, trying to figure it out. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's I find it remarkable, quite surprising that some brands don't even just put their branding below the pinion instead of above it. I mean, even that would maybe solve the problem. But um, but there you go. Uh, I kind of um, I got a lot of stick actually on one of the videos I did about the Tudor Ranger, because again, with a sort of a design background and, and I look at that and aesthetically, the dial just doesn't quite look right to me um, I think there's too much negative space um, there's maybe not enough text beneath the pinion um, and a lot of people said hey, this is crazy it's a beautiful feel watch why are you criticize it but I, I kind of have such a visual person I look at something and if it doesn't quite work it, it's just not for me exactly and you can you know especially when you're in your kind of your design programs or whatever you can be talking about fractions of millimeters you know, uh, the sort of what, when people ask, oh, you know, what size are, the, are these watches? Is it 38? Is it 39? I say, well, actually, it's 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 38.5. And it's it, originally when I when I started telling people that it's like. It felt like there was no real reason. It's like, well, why didn't you just pick one or the other? But when you're in your uh, design programs and you're working at it at, at 10 times, 15, 20 times scale, mm. that half a mil makes such a huge difference in terms of in terms of the, the general layout and the aesthetic. So, Definitely. yeah, it's, it's all about those uh, those little details. No, that's right. Exactly. Um, I mean, one of the things that I think was really interesting to me as well um, as a, I guess, a watch geek was the fact that you chose a manual wind movement for it rather than going for an automatic. And personally, I, I don't think there are enough manual wind watches around these days. Um, and I'd love to see that become something that, you know, that maybe comes back a little bit more. But what was the thought process behind that? Why did you go for a manual wind? There was a couple of reasons. Um, one, I think, you know, a manual wind chrono, especially this movement, is is stunning to look at. And it was, I think, you know, this movement was originally designed in, I think, the 1940s. So it was never built to be an automatic calibre. Because often you see you see mechanical watches uh, or hand-wound watches now, and all it will be is an automatic where the rotor is essentially just removed. So you don't really get to see, you know, all that much because it's designed to have a rotor on. Half of it was always, you know, intended to be covered. So this one from the outset was was always made to be, you know, to be seen. I also really liked the idea that you've got this juxtaposition between this incredibly old movement that you have to hand wind, super old tech with then this kind of modern playful dial with fun elements. And not only that, the fact that it's it's hand wound is you know, it forces you in a way to, you know, every morning or every other day when you're winding it to to spend a couple of seconds like looking at the dial and kind of appreciating either design details or some of the textures and whatever. Um, so With yeah, very that's, eyes. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, so yeah. So what came first? Was it the design of the dial or and the case, or was it the movement? Did you know which? So typically, when you know when when it comes to comes to designing a watch, you start with the movement because um, the you know the either the proportions of the movement or more importantly exactly where the hands are so for the chrono obviously there's there's three positions where the hands are you know you've got mm -hmm. the central and then you've got the two subdials so that's like a really important place to start because you know, you've got certain geometries and certain uh, distances that that are fixed and you can't really mess around with. Um, I remember in, you know, I think Mike France was giving an interview and, and he said when 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 he started and when Christopher Ward started, they kind of started designing a dial 
without any uh, without considering kind of what movements were available and you know they came up with these really cool concepts of right this is where the power reserve is going to be this function is going to be here this that that the other and then when you try and work backwards from there you know you 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 end up the only way really to do it is to develop a bespoke movement which is going to cost a ludicrous yeah. amount uh, of investment so yeah typically and, and and from especially at my price point and where i start the approach is movement first and then kind of building around yeah. that unless you, you you know you really want to be developing your own movement yeah and uh, and that's a whole different story and um, yeah one day one day <laughs> <laughs> one day <laughs> yeah um, I mean, going going back to, um, I suppose, and again, it's probably this question comes from my background a bit, but, you know, as a former marketing guy, I, I kind of what really impressed me is how you've launched the business and, you know, you've built a brand incredibly well, incredibly quickly. Um, but, you know, you don't strike me as a company who has got huge resources behind it and, and big marketing budgets. So did you have any experience in that area or, or kind of how did you go about doing that? So not necessarily having experience, one thing that I was always interested in doing in, in all my prior roles was was trying to get my, um, just trying to get involved in, in all aspects. So again, with my previous role, whenever there was an opportunity to, to somehow be involved in, in the launch of a new product uh, or you know hosting an event or whatever, I'd be sure to kind of like volunteer myself, even though I was... I had little to no capacity left in terms of I had so many responsibilities. I was always just driven to, you know, anything that I didn't quite understand, I'd want to be involved in just to, you know, to to try and better understand it. And I found that in, found that really interesting. If there's something that I don't understand or I'm I'm not aware of, I, I'm always keen to learn. So so that was something that, that certainly helped when it came to launching. That being said, so much of the kind of the growth in terms of visibility of the brands has been organic. It's been by, you know, enthusiasts um, wanting to share this product and wanting to share this kind of this brand and, uh, and what I'm doing with their friends and, and you know, Instagram and socials and whatnot have, have been so, so helpful in doing so. So. Yeah, very fortunate in that way. I think also that comes down to because the dials are so colourful and, and, and the brand is seems to be you know quite recognisable at a glance. It helps with kind of general general visibility. And when people share it, people are more likely to engage, which is which is then then help to, to scale and, and grow the business as well as yeah, as well as visibility. So there's no yeah there's no magic formula that I was following it was just I feel like I was very fortunate in in that regard. Mm. Did you send pieces out to the watch media and and try to engage with those guys or did that happen by accident? Yeah so originally um so at the start you know before I'd launched nobody knew who I was what the brand was so I was really having to kind of reach out to the people that I'd followed uh, and the people that I respected as an enthusiast and I would listen to their opinion. I would reach out to them and, and try and see if they wanted to, you know, to get hands on with some samples, even if it was just for feedback. You know, I was happy to, to send samples to people that I respected, you know, even if they weren't going to publish or generate any content or, or help help to build, you know, build visibility. I would I would have just been happy for for their feedback for them to give me pointers was very much happy to 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 take any information that I could um one of the first people to kind of or one of the the people that I really wanted to reach out to was uh was Jody from Just One More Watch mm. so I knew that he must get so many emails every single day from you know from from up and coming micro brands so I was like, right, how can I kind of make a bit of a splash and, and just make sure I get seen and, and kind of communicate who I am? Because mm. he must get the same old email. This is, you know, this is my brand. This is what we're doing. We're here to, um, you know, disrupt the industry, blah, blah, blah. He's heard it all before. So I I put together a, a sort of a, a three minute video and a kind of throughout the video made references to 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 what he says and what he does in his videos I thought it was a good mean a good way to communicate with him because that's how he mm. communicates with the enthusiast market he makes videos 
and you I started off of going hello. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And I said, let's flip the camera and have a, you know, all the yeah. kind of the uh, the little um, voice bits and, and whatnot. And and he really appreciated that, and and that was really useful because it a communicated who I was way better than I could ever do in an email. It got you know it got his attention and he was already then kind of engaged and interested so i sent him some uh sent him some samples and you know he obviously liked the product so that was my first kind of breakthrough um so again still having to kind of work and hustle and and, and try and see how i can get in front of the right people and, and and doing whatever i could to you know to get in front of those people and as the brand has kind of grown that's now changed a little bit in terms of people are more aware of Studio Underdog. You know, it's not necessarily a kind of uh, a new up and coming micro brand in terms of, oh, are they actually even going to make watches? People know that, our, you know, watches are currently being made, mm. they're currently being assembled. You know, everyone that's uh, that's that's placed an order has, has either got it or is getting it soon. Um, so there's less risk in that sense. Uh, and it means then people are, are more, you know, likely or interested in covering it because I'm slightly more established. So, yeah, that's changed in the, in the last year or so. But the start was was very much a, a hustle. Mm, I can imagine. And it's interesting what you say about Jody, because when I was starting my channel, um, I, you know, I always believe that it's great to learn from other people. And, you know, I used to watch tons and tons of content on YouTube. Um, but I decided to reach out to a handful of YouTubers who I respected and whose videos I liked. And there were only two who actually replied to me. And yeah, I just shot them a message just saying, look, I know you're busy guys, but this one I'm looking at doing. Um, I'd love any tips, any advice you can give me. And Jody was one of the only the two people who wrote back to me with a lengthy message with lots of advice and support. And, and he was a really good guy. Exactly, exactly. So, so you know... Um... Yeah, it kind of sounds like we've uh, had a similar kind of thought process in in how do we start? Let's try and get as much information from people that, you know, that clearly know what they're mm. doing. Um, so no, I'm, I'm glad to hear that. He's a, yeah, he's a really nice guy. Yeah, absolutely. So you launched this watch. I think it launched on Kickstarter originally. Was that right? Yeah, correct. Launched on Kickstarter uh, March, March last year. So you would have had an idea, I guess, that it was going to be a sellout or that you were going to achieve the funding, presumed by the launch day or? Absolutely not. No, you know, so right, okay. you're obviously you're building up to this campaign and you've, you know, I was working towards, you know, having content with content creators. So so there was some visibility on launch in the weeks up to up to the launch. I was, you know, sharing details, making sure to to get people's emails down if, if they were interested so they could be you know made aware of the launch. But someone writing on a Facebook comment in a, you know, in a Facebook group, microbrand watches saying, oh, I love this. Yeah, I'll be sure to grab one. That Facebook comment, you don't you never know uh, yeah. if someone's actually interested in buying until they've pressed that buy button. So up until the launch, you know, I had a, a few hundred people on my mailing list and I'd got some, you know, a couple of um, a couple of uh, content creators to make some content around it. But, yeah, I, I had no idea as to whether whether it would be a, a successful campaign or not to kind of hit live on Kickstarter. I've still got my screen recording. I made sure to re re record the screen so I could uh you know, just look back on it, uh, if it, if it was a success and, and, you know, even now looking back on the 18 months is, is quite fun to, you know, to, to see myself pressing that button. Um, and yeah, so, so I kind of hit the, uh, hit the target relatively quickly, um, and then kind of went on to, you know, to, to raise more money, which was actually very much needed. You know, I think all Kickstarter creators probably, underestimate how much uh you know funding is required um because mm. you're always trying to work towards keeping the uh you know the target lower so it's more achievable um but yeah i was i was very glad to uh to, to kind of go over my uh, original target yeah and that's um that must have been amazing i mean what what was the the feeling like i guess to to get to the point where you knew right this is something that is actually going to be real and, and is going to happen 
it was a it was a mixture of you know excitement being like okay wow this is you know we're starting this is this is something people are interested in people are you know willing to kind of take the risk you know because kickstarter is a risk you know a lot of a lot of brands um underestimate uh how yeah underestimate the difficulty of, of getting a watch to market so yeah, it was exciting to know that right here we go we're we're moving, but it was also quite daunting thinking okay now you know this is a level of responsibility you know this is customers that are are not only putting their trust in me but putting their their hard hard earned money uh, into mm-hmm. supporting the campaign and, and are expecting you know a watch at, at the end of it, um, and I didn't want to let anyone down. I also had you know a vision. I think a lot of Kickstarters or a lot of projects will they'll kind of, they'll just scrape through. They'll just about kind of get the products to the customers. Some customers might not be that happy, but they're kind of, you know, they'll, and they sort of lose communication and sort of fizzle out. I very much wanted to to be around for, for a long time and, and I wanted this to be the start. So, you know, I was really keen to to stick to the kind of the, the delivery schedule, which again, a lot of Kickstarters mm. will miss. You know, there's Kickstarters that, Five years later, past the delivery date, they're still kind of, you know, working on it. I wanted to make sure that, that I could do everything to to get watches on wrists as soon as possible um, and quality watches as well. I wanted people to who receive their watches to go, all right, here we go. You know, this is this is the start of something. And and to all those backers that, you know, that did help the original funding, they very much helped to to bring this brand to life and and kind of, you know, I have them to thank for, for what it is today, really. Uh, that's absolutely amazing. And then, of course, the second release. I mean, that sold out within, I think I said on my video, within about six minutes, I believe, wasn't it? That was just incredible. Six minutes, exactly, yeah. So so demand, you know, as uh, I think once I fulfilled that first batch and kind of then people could see that, you know, I was here and, and, and watches were, were being made and promises were being, you know, were being met and fulfilled... Um, it kind of the the visibility, the interest really sort of grew from there. As I said, when I started, I was thinking, how many people really want uh, a watermelon themed manual wind chrono watch? <laughs> like, come on, it's got to be me and a handful of other people on this planet. But uh, you and your mum, no, yeah, me, my mum, maybe my dad. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, no, that was. Um, yeah, it always it it always um, seems quite crazy that the the, the demand continues to uh, um, to grow. Um, yeah, as, as as people get made aware of the of the brand. Mm. Now I know that you've got something new in the pipeline, and I know you can't really say too much about that. So I'm not going to push you to uh, to give away any secrets on that one. Um, but <laughs> no, you, you can feel... try, try your best. Try your best. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I'll, I'll work on you a bit, but. Uh... But do you feel any any pressure that you know there's there's a, a lot of expectation now on on what's going to come next and almost like that kind of the big second album isn't it you know how do you follow up something that's been such a huge success really in the community? That's it, and that's exactly how I've been kind of thinking about it. Is it is the second album, um, and it's an opportunity for me to show what the brand is about. You know, we've we've people know the core range they know that the chronograph collection now and that could take a number of roads in terms of what's next for the brand is studio on dog is it just a case of kind of you know watermelon colors on a different type of watch is it going to be a you know the next watch i introduce so i'm developing a field watch is that just going to be pink and green on a dial made to sort of look roughly like a watermelon I think there's a lot more to the brand than that. And I think that's what mm. I hope to show with this second album. So, you know, a, a great second album, if we're talking about music, is one that often doesn't doesn't sound exactly like the first. There's got to be right. some evolution, some some development. Um, and I think that's what I've achieved. Um, I've I'm obviously I've, I've kind of. I've got samples. I've you know I've, I've designed the watches. I'm I'm close to ready to uh, you know ready to hit the button in terms of production and, and getting watches out there. The only thing that's sort of stopping me at the moment is I've got a lot of outstanding orders for the Chronograph collection. Mm. I want to fulfil those. Make sure people are you know get to enjoy those watches before releasing something new. 
you know, I can imagine if I, you know, as a customer, it would be frustrating to see a brand introducing newness whilst I'm still waiting on on an order. So, yeah, just just holding off for the time being. But some something's in the works, and, and I'm quite excited for it to come to fruition. Yeah, no, it's. Um, I think everyone's looking forward to seeing what it's going to be. But um, but I guess it'll know, be worth got... it'll be worth the wait. I think. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> you're definitely building some anticipation now. <laughs> But you know, I mean, I think that um, what really appealed to me about about the chronograph and and what you did with with the colours and and the movement and the whole thing is is just doing something that's a bit different, you know. But also not just sort of different for different sake. There's a balance between kind of new and old and traditional and contemporary, and and I think that's what really works. So yeah, it's, I think you you summed that, that up. You've summed that up you've summed that up better than I could. I think that, you know, that really, I, f- I feel like you've already got a sort of a really good understanding of the brand. And that's what I want to communicate for the next launch. And essentially, I feel like what I've managed to achieve uh, with the original collection, the Chrono collection is kind of uh, innovation through design in terms of the use of the, the kind of the dial layout, this sort of uh, juxtaposition of, of old tech and modern colors. And, that's kind of what I want to achieve is is innovation. Um, and for the next one, yes, Studio Underdog is colour is, is hugely important. But I also want to see where else I can go and, and, and how else I can uh, can innovate. Um, and on and, and on that topic, you know, the, the release recent release from from Christopher Ward, where we, we bumped into each other, mm-hmm. actually, the the Bel Canto launch. That was a huge motivator for me, seeing that, you know, a British brand, fine, these guys have got 15 years of experience on me in terms of how long they've been in the industry. But seeing that a brand like them and how they're innovating and and the boundaries that they're pushing, yeah, it's super motivating. And it kind of it makes me explore even more ideas and and push to be even more ambitious. Um, So hopefully we'll, we'll see that within within Studio Underdog as well in 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 the future so it's going to be a digital watch in a bronze case you heard it here first <laughs> uh, imagine imagine <laughs> <laughs> so I, I guess you know um life must be pretty different for you now than it was 18 months ago or before lockdown let's say so what what's a typical working week now look like for you oh god it's all over the place um <laughs> You know, it's I'm still a, a small brand. It's it's just me. Um, there's there's no one else. There's no one else really helping. Obviously, I work with with certain partners and suppliers and and whatnot. But in terms of that studio underdog, yeah, it's it's just me. So the responsibility kind of you know has grown, and then also the you know what I'm required to do within the company. I've had to learn about finance. I've had to you know do my own accounting. I have to sort of manage orders, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, all these things I've had to kind of learn and try and figure out. So every day is slightly different. You know, trying to to put out one fire and uh, and 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 move on and and find solutions and whatnot. So very difficult to to explain a working day. Um, but I'm sure that it's going to change even even more as the months kind of go on. I need to make sure I can, you know, I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not dedicating too much time to all the other bits. And I need to focus on kind of the design and the development, which is essentially yeah. what has, has made the brand a success. So I make sure those don't get put by the wayside for, for too long. Yeah, that's uh, it's too easy to get sidetracked from the things that are really important, isn't it? And you know, with IT and all of those kind of stuff that that we have to deal with. Exactly, but they're you know they're necessary evils, as it were. So uh, yeah, still still kind of uh, figuring out as I go along. Uh, that's very much the uh, the strategy. Yeah, absolutely. Well, look, I wish you all the best, and and I really appreciate you coming on the channel to to talk to us today. Um, no, you well, know, thank uh... you, thank you for having me, and you know, I, I really enjoyed sort of the the video you did on the brands, and as as I said, you know, you've clearly got a a good understanding as as to what I've you know what I'm trying to achieve and to be able to pick up on the kind of the little design details, um, yeah, it's it's great to hear. So no, I I appreciate that. Well, I can't wait to get my hands on on the next watch when it comes along, and um, and hopefully get the opportunity to uh, to review that one as well. Yeah, for sure. No, thank you. Brilliant, Richard. You've been a great guest. Thank you so much for coming on the channel today. 
and we'll speak soon. Thanks again. Cheers. Thank you.